you so much for joining us for our webinar. My name is Dustin Saldariaga, and I'm a senior associate at Scott Legal PC. We're going to be spending some time today to talk about the EB2 National Interest Waiver, or NIW. It's a green card um, that is, we believe, an underutilized category and one that we've started to see being used more and more uh, by people uh, who want to get a green card, especially entrepreneurs. Today, we're very fortunate to have our firm's managing attorney, Kelly Legrand Wiener, to speak with us. Uh, Kelly has significant experience uh, across the spectrum of business immigration, uh, including in the area of national interest waivers. Um, and uh, before we get started, I did want to go over a few housekeeping items. First is, although our firm does have a focus on business immigration, um, we also handle family immigration cases as well as humanitarian immigration cases. So we encourage you, if you have any questions about uh, U.S. immigration law uh, uh, in, as, it, as it regards really anything, we hope that you will not hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, we do um, continue, uh, this is part of a webinar series, we do plan to do at least two webinars a month, uh, and we've been doing these for some time. We cover a variety of immigration topics, so um, we hope to see you on our future webinars as well. Um, after this presentation, we'll be sending you all an email with a few uh, pieces of information in it. The first is a copy of the PowerPoint, which you see on your screen now. We'll also share with you our comprehensive guide on the national interest waiver. Uh, we'll also send you a link where you can sign up for the future webinars that I mentioned a moment ago. And we'll also share a link to our YouTube channel. And on our YouTube channel, we, we do post our past webinars. We'll be posting this webinar, which will be recorded. And we post a number of shorter videos uh, that, that really cover the spectrum of US immigration law. And we try to put very high quality information on our YouTube channel, obviously for free. So uh, please do check that out. If you have a question during our presentation, and I see that questions are already starting to roll in, uh, please do share those with me through either the Q&A function on Zoom or the chat function on Zoom. I'll be monitoring those and I'll either share those with Kelly uh, at the moment they come up, if they're relevant to, to where she is in the presentation, or I'll save them for the end of the presentation. But we do plan to get to all the questions by the end of our presentation. Um, and finally, as I mentioned before, our webinar is being recorded, uh, and you'll be receiving a link to that uh, to, to view it on YouTube after the presentation is over. So with that, I will pass it off to Kelly to continue the presentation. Thank you, Kelly, for being here with us. Thank you, Dustin. No, thank you for, for that information and that introduction. Um, you know, as, as you mentioned, we'll be talking about the National Interest Waiver today, which um, is, you know, kind of a previously underutilized category. Uh, you know, before 2017, there was kind of a different standard um, under which they adjudicated the National Interest Waivers. And it was a much more confusing standard um, and one that was really not nearly as friendly to entrepreneurs. Um, and there was a case, a matter of Danazar, that changed this um, in 2016. And it really opened up the standard for national interest waivers uh, considerably, in particular for entrepreneurs. There's some particularly favorable language uh, for entrepreneurs that came out through Janazar. And then um, in 2022, there was kind of even more favorable um, changes to the U.S. policy guidance that helped us, um, you know, help demonstrate that the government does view the EB2 national interest waiver category as a category that is appropriate for many different types of, um, of people, including entrepreneurs. Um, so let's get into the, um, the basic requirements for the national interest waiver. So this uh, category of green card is under the EB2 category. And what that means is there is a threshold requirement um, that you demonstrate either an advanced degree or equivalent. I'm um, going to shown here, advanced degree means a master's or higher, and an equivalent would be a bachelor's degree plus five years of post-baccalaureate progressive work experience in the relevant profession. Now, what if you don't have a degree? Um, perhaps you only have an associate's, perhaps you only went to high school and then began your working career. Um, so the EB2 could still be available to you if you can demonstrate exceptional ability. 
Um, so the you have to meet at least three of seven criteria. The seven criteria are listed on the PowerPoint, which will also be made available to you later. Um, so I won't kind of name them all, but as you can see on the PowerPoint, um, you know, many different um, kind of areas that are relevant to determining do you have this exceptional ability um, in your particular field. Um, you know, so this is different than extraordinary ability. Um, so exceptional ability is more a, a degree of expertise significantly above that ordinarily encountered in your field. Um, and there's really a two part kind of test that they'll look at for this. So one is do you meet the basic criteria? So for example, one of these criteria is membership in a professional association. So um, perhaps you are a member of an industry organization, then you've met the baseline um, you know, first step. However, they'll also look at a second step, which is, does that membership show that you are someone who has expertise above that ordinarily encountered in your field? And that's to say that the type of membership they'd be looking for is one where perhaps you have to be invited, um, you know, based on your achievements or your accomplishments. Um, it really wouldn't be the type of thing where, let's say you just, you know, you pay a memberly or a, a yearly fee for a membership. And um, and therefore you uh, you know are able to join that really wouldn't kind of pass that second test to show exceptional ability. Um, so we you know important to kind of keep in mind you need to meet one of these threshold criteria for EB2 to kind of even be on the table for you before we even get to the national interest waiver piece. So let's assume we've met the threshold criteria. Um, the second step, um, you know, under EB2, it, it's normally the case that you are required to have a job offer from a U.S. employer, and that employer must test the U.S. labor market. Um, so what the National Interest Waiver category is doing is asking the government to waive that requirement of the job offer and the labor market test. And the way that you demonstrate that they should waive the um, these uh, you know, the, the job offer and labor market test is you demonstrate that you, you are engaging or going to engage in a proposed endeavor that has substantial merit and national importance to the United States, that you yourself are well positioned to advance that proposed endeavor. And then once you meet the third, on balance, it's beneficial to the U.S. to waive the requirements of the job offer and the labor certification. So when we, when we look at each of these, um, Really, you know, let, let's say, let, let's take the first one, you know, so substantial merit and national importance. Um, are you developing a particular type of technology um, that's going to advance, you know, any type of, um, you know, something in the United States that's helpful, for example, cybersecurity services? Are you consulting with government agencies on something that's extremely important to, um, you know, military or civilian technology? Um, Think about what you're doing, and and this could be many, many, many different fields. Um, there are there is a list of kind of critical and emerging technologies the government has put out, but other types of endeavors can also qualify, as long as you can demonstrate that substantial merit and national importance. But something to keep in mind is it's it's really not you know. If you're an entrepreneur and you're working in your industry and you're doing a really good job, that's really not what is going to meet the criteria for the national interest waiver. Um, if you're working in that industry and you have some type of new product that is changing the way things are done for the better, making things more efficient, if you're developing a software that's going to be widely used by leading industry players, those are the types of things that are generally going to rise to the level of that criteria. So just something to keep in mind is I think we do sometimes get you know, applicants that come and say, well, I'm a business owner and I, you know, my business is going well. And I think that it's, it's not enough to just have, um, you know, a business that's going well, there's things that you can do, if, especially if you're hiring lots of people in an underserved area, that may be beneficial, but generally you need to be looking at, you know, does my business have substantial merit and national importance other than just, it's a business operating in the United States and making money. It needs to kind of rise above that and have some other type of, um, of benefit. So let's look at the second prong. This is, um, you know, you yourself, the applicant, are you well positioned to advance this endeavor? So what does this mean? Um, they're going to look at your education, your track record of success. Have you done this type of endeavor before and have you done it successfully? Um, 
if you're if this is an endeavor that's ongoing for you, where you're perhaps here on let's say an E2 visa or some or an O1 visa or some other type of visa and already working in this endeavor, how is it going? Um, have you received any awards? Have you received any funding? Um, you know, do you have evidence that this is likely to succeed? Do you have a viable business plan? Um, so these are all important kind of for that for that second prong. Um, and then once you meet the third, you know, once you kind of get to the third prong saying on balance, it'd be beneficial to the U.S. to waive the requirements of the, the job offer and labor certification. Um, if you're an entrepreneur, you know, you can always argue that, you know, it doesn't make sense for you to have to go through the labor certification process because as a majority owner, you would never be able to actually utilize that process. You, you know, It's not available to majority owners of, of companies. Um, similarly, you could argue that what you're doing is so important that even if there are others in the United States doing the same work, it's an urgent enough need um, that, you know, it, it's better to have you as well uh, doing this, particularly if your, you know, your track record of accomplishments shows that you would be doing this at a very high level. Um, so those are kind of the basic requirements for the National Interest Waiver. Move to the next slide. So let's talk a bit about how the National Interest Waiver can be used in particular for entrepreneurs. Um, so you know, a, a big change in Danazar that was really helpful for entrepreneurs was, um, you know, a few different things that were mentioned here. So one is that the benefits to the U.S. interest can be local. And um, this was really key because previously there was a focus on endeavor needing to be national in scope kind of geographically. Um, so what Danazar did was kind of clarify that, let's say that you have a company that's you know, doing a, a lot of hiring in an economically depressed area, you know, um, you know, dozens or hundreds of employees being hired in this particular area, um, you know, that that itself could be, um, you know, to considered to have substantial merit and national importance, even though it's only happening in this local area, it's still nationally important to increase employment in economically depressed areas. So this was a really key change that was clarified in Danazar. Another important point from Danazar was that they specifically mentioned that, you know, entrepreneurs are self-employed and are generally not eligible, um, you know, to go through the labor certification process. Um, it is literally impossible, um, you know, for them to get the green card through that process just because of the, you know, their percentage of ownership. Um, therefore, that can be used as a reason why it's beneficial to waive, you know, the requirement of the job offer and labor certification. So this was a really helpful clarification for entrepreneurs. Um, also, another helpful thing was, um, you know, they, they pointed out that the, there's an emphasis on perspective impact. So you don't need to show when you go in for your application that your that your proposed endeavor will 100% succeed. You only need to show that it's likely to succeed. Um, so, you know, the idea that, you know, they acknowledge that not every entrepreneurial venture will succeed, but as long as you can demonstrate that it, you know, it's more likely than not that it will, then you can still proceed and, and, and be granted the national interest waiver. So I think that was that was really helpful as well, particularly for um, you know, applicants that are kind of in more of the startup stage of their business where they don't necessarily have that established track record for that particular venture yet. I, I think this was this was language in Danisar was really meant to open that up to entrepreneurs and make it clear to them. And if they have a solid business plan, um, you know, if they have these other evidence, um, you know, that the endeavor will succeed, you know, funding from outside um, sources, you know, anyone that's interested perhaps in purchasing their products, you know, letters from industry leaders or leaders in government or, or charitable institutions, that these can all be really helpful um, to show that um, they, they qualify for the National Interest Waiver. All right, let's uh, switch gears a bit and talk about timing um, and kind of considerations when you're moving from a non-immigrant visa, um, you know, to a national interest waiver green card. Um, so, uh, you know, a very, very positive change that we had in the last year was that premium processing became available for, for national interest waiver applications. This was not the case for a long time, and national interest waiver applications were taking over a year to be adjudicated under normal processing. So this was a really positive change. Um, and what premium processing does is it means that if you pay an additional $2,500, then the, um, the government will review your case and will issue a decision within 45 days. Um, 
that decision may be an approval, it may be a request for evidence, it may be a notice of intent to deny, or it might be a denial. Um, one, one thing to mention is that the way that they've um, described this is that they will start the 45 days as of the time that they've received everything needed to adjudicate the petition. This means that if they feel you sent in an application that was perhaps too bare bones or didn't address the baseline requirements for the visa or anything important was missing, the 45 days would not start, um, you know, and you would get a notice, you know, of deficiency of, of what you needed to provide. And then they would only start the 45 days once they confirm they have everything needed to adjudicate the petition. So, Let's talk also about um, underlying visa status. So if you are on a non-immigrant visa that does not specifically allow for dual intent, so thinking about perhaps a TN visa, perhaps an F1 visa, you know, those both have very high standards um, for proving non-immigrant intent, then once you file your I-140 petition, it may be much more difficult to, um, you know, renew that, renew that visa. So let's say you have it, you're on a TN visa, and you're coming to the end of your three years, um, and you have the an, op an option to renew your TN, but you also want to file your national interest waiver, we'd likely recommend that you, if you want to renew your TN, renew the TN first, and then file for your national interest waiver after you've renewed your TN. Because once you have an I-140 pending, um, or filed, or approved, it's much harder to argue that you do not have immigrant intent. Um, not impossible, particularly if you, you select that you plan to a consular process, um, you know, go through consular processing as opposed to adjusting status in the U.S., um, but just an important thing to keep in mind, and you always want to talk with your immigration attorney before filing any immigrant petition, just to understand what impact will this have on my status, um, what impact and what impact will this have on my ability to, um, you know, renew my visa, um, you know, or get another visa. Uh, you know, so always important to plan ahead. Um, so in terms of the actual application process, uh, you're going to submit form I-140 with proof that you meet all the EB-2 qualifications. So the, all those qualifications we just talked about, the threshold requirements and the proof that you meet the national interest waiver standard. Um, if the, an immigrant visa is currently available under the EB-2 category, then you would also potentially be able to concurrently file for a green card application, that's I-485. Um, you can also file the I-140 and check that you choose to consular process. Um, you know, that means you'll go to a consulate abroad. Um, right now, unfortunately, the EB-2 category is backlogged worldwide. So that means that no matter what country you're from, um, you're not able to concurrently file at this time. Um, so, you know, we are hopeful that the category will become current again sometime perhaps later in this fiscal year, but for now, it, it unfortunately is backlogged. Um, so what does this mean? Uh, you know, ultimately, filing the I-140 alone does not give you any status in the United States. So let's say that you are here, um, you know, on a, on a visitor visa, um, and your, uh, you know, your status, your I-94 is expiring, but you filed an I-140. The fact that you filed the I-140 does not give you any ability to stay in the United States. So that's just an important thing to know. Um, I think sometimes people have this perception that because you filed a, po a portion of a green card application, it gives you some ability to stay, but the I-140 alone does not. Um, so talking about the pros and cons of adjusting status versus consular processing, Adjusting status um, is where you would file the I-140, and then either at the same time or a later time, you're going to file Form I-485. Um, this is, um, you know, the benefit of this is it permits you to stay in the United States. Once you filed your adjustment of status, um, you know, you are in a period of authorized stay while it's pending. Um, you, you are also able to apply for work and travel authorization at the same time that you file that I-485. So often for people who are already in the U.S., perhaps on a, a work visa, and you know their lives are already here and they want to stay in the United States, often adjusting status can be a good option for them because it does give you that ability to stay in the US. Um, something important to note is that once you file the I-485, um, for most applicants, you are not permitted to leave the United States until you get travel authorization approved. And those travel authorization applications are taking quite a while, um, somewhere between nine months to 12 months or even a little bit more. So if you are doing an adjustment of status, you need to feel comfortable staying in the United States for, you know, several months, you know, perhaps 
Um, the only caveat to this is um, for certain visa applicants. So if someone's on an H-1B or an L-1 and they're coming to, uh, they're traveling in and out to work for the same employer, they may be able to travel even while the adjustment is pending before the travel authorization. But that's a, you know, I'd say very rare situations or very um, limited situations. You always, if you have an adjustment of status pending, you always want to speak with your attorney before any travel. Because if you do travel um, and you're not on an H or an L and you're not coming back to work for the same employer, then you've essentially abandoned your green card application and you would have to refile. Um, so let's talk about consular processing. Um, consular processing would be the process where uh, your application, your, once your I-140 is approved, that approval gets sent to the consulate um, in the country where you most previously resided, most recently resided. And, um, and then you would process your green card application through that consulate. Um, this is a process where you're going to send all your biographical documents to the National Visa Center. They'll confirm they have everything they need. Then they'll send it to the consulate and the consulate will schedule you for an appointment. Um, you know, right now, I'd say that in terms of timing, they're both taking similarly long amounts of time, unfortunately. Consulates are still very backlogged from COVID. USCIS is very backlogged as well. Um, so in, in both circumstances, you know, you would be facing, you know, several months to even up up to and over a year in terms of getting the green card. And right now, unfortunately, because the EB2 category is backlogged in either space with USCIS or with the consulate, um, you know, there's there would be no movement on the green card portion until that category becomes current. Um, uh, consular processing, the last thing I'll say about it is just, uh, it, it's generally most appropriate for people who need to travel very frequently. Um, perhaps you need to travel for business, you're in and out of the U.S. a lot. It would not be acceptable for you to have to wait in the U.S. for six months, eight months, or longer for the travel authorization. In those cases, consular processing is going to be a, a, a better fit for you. Great. And Kelly, a question did come in that's uh, that's related to this uh, this topic, um, and, it, and it gets at the interaction between a non-immigrant visa and the EB-2 application. If someone has a valid B-1 or B-2 visa, does that in any way impact the EB-2 NIW application at all? And then on the flip side, if the NIW is denied, does that impact an existing B-1 or B-2 visa? Sure. So, um, you know, having a valid B1 or B2 visa in itself does not in any way diminish the chances of getting a national interest waiver. They're just two completely separate things. Um, so the fact that you, you know, received a B1, B2 visa at some point in time, um, and at that point in time, your intent was temporary, and then later you apply for a green card, um, you know, those two things are not necessarily um, in tension with one another because intent is always assessed at each entry so or, or at each um, you know, time you apply. So when you're applying for your B1, B2, as long as you have temporary intent, that's okay. Um, will you be blacklisted from getting a few, an, another B1, B2 if your NIW is denied? So I don't think no, like there's not a process whereby you're um, absolutely blacklisted from getting a B1, B2, but let's say that you, um, you know, you apply for an NIW, it gets denied, and now you're applying for your new B1, B2 visa. On that application, you will have to fill out a DS-160 um, where you have to disclose that you had previously applied for an immigrant visa. Um, depending on the circumstances of that situation and how, you know, how close in time you're applying for this B1, B2 visa, yes, I mean, you may potentially have more issues with that subsequent B1, B2 application because they may ask more questions about your actual intent. But the fact that you have applied and then were denied does not mean you'll be always blacklisted from getting a B1, B2, but it is something to consider in the sense that you will have to disclose it on future visa applications and you will have to explain it um, to the officer's satisfaction in order to qualify for another B1, B2 in the future. Perfect. Thank you, Kelly. So we can move on to updated guidelines for STEM and entrepreneurs. Perfect. Perfect. So um, this was a very favorable uh kind of change that, you know, that happened along the same lines of, you know, in matter of Danisar, you know, that the court indicated, uh, you know, that, that this category was, you know, meant to be, you know, interpreted more flexibly, you know, used for entrepreneurs in a way it hadn't before. 
And, um, you know, I think the government as well, you know, in these policy updates really uh, confirmed that, um, you know, that the national interest waiver is meant to be a more expansive category than it previously was being used for in, you know, prior to 2016. Um, so a few things they did. So one is um, put in some STEM specific guidelines. Um, so indicated that there are some critical and emerging technologies that have national importance. Um, you know, put out there that, you know, the, the government will be favoring these types of endeavors, any endeavors that advance STEM technologies and research in academic or private industry settings. Um, if you have an advanced degree in STEM, you know, this is a favorable, uh, you know, indication for proving that you're well positioned, you know, to, to advance the proposed endeavor. Um, so it doesn't mean that it's, you know, 100% determinative if you have a STEM degree that you'll absolutely qualify for the national interest waiver, but it is meant to be a positive factor. Um, and something that you, you know, can specifically rely on um, in your application. There were also some, um, you know, favorable changes that were made for entrepreneurs, in particular, um, kind of naming different types of evidence that could be that could show uh, that an endeavor has substantial merit or national importance or that the person is well positioned. Um, so this was very helpful because, you know, I think that, you know, entrepreneurs in particular sometimes have a different focus than when you think of national interest waiver for scientists or for people who are going to have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of publications or or things like that. So this was um very favorable change to help focus USCIS on which types of evidence are helpful for entrepreneurs. So things like significant media attention, um, awards or grants from government entities, um, any letters from kind of venture capital funding, um, you know, investors, um, anyone in your industry that would use your type of product that's, you know, a well-known company or an expert that's excited about your endeavor. Um, any government agencies that are interested in, in, in the work that you're doing, any evidence the company has already made money, any evidence the company has um, the ability to create jobs, sometimes uh, doing a, a report from an economist who can kind of evaluate the business plan or the business model and write um, to explain what the uh, likely, you know, future hiring and, um, you know, revenue impacts will be, that can be very helpful. Um, also, if you're going to show that as an entrepreneur that, you know, you're well positioned to advance the endeavor. Um, the fact that you have, you know, ownership or a critical role in this entity, um, you know, that can be very helpful. Um, any proof that you've been part of an incubator or an accelerator, which is very common for, for startups, uh, any receipt of government grants, any intellectual property um, by you or by the company, so any patents, things like that. Um, any any kind of third party reviewers that have you know reviewed your product and are excited about its impact on the industry, all of these things are now um, kind of more officially being considered by USCIS as part of the analysis for the national interest waiver, and this is very favorable generally for for entrepreneurs. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what will actually be included um, in your national interest waiver submission. So first would be, um, you know, proof that you meet one of the threshold requirements. So if you have, you know, a master's degree or higher, this can be quite simple, a copy of your degree, a copy of your certified transcripts. Um, if you're qualifying with a bachelor's plus five years of progressive work experience, you'll also need to provide, um, you know, employer letters that, uh, you know, kind of verify your work experience and should also address how it's progressive, you know, over the five years. Um, if you're going with exceptional ability, then you'll need, um, you know, a bit more, uh, you'll need, you know, kind of significant documentation showing that you meet three out of the seven criteria to show exceptional ability. As previously mentioned, it's not just showing, you know, you're a member in a professional association, you would need to show proof of your membership, proof that the organization itself is prestigious, proof of what, um, what you had to do to be, you know, be to become a member, and it should be more than just paying dues, it should be more based on kind of your accomplishments, your expertise in the field. Um, so all good things to keep in mind. Um, but if you're going the exceptional ability route, you want to know it's going to be a bit more challenging because um, you will have to provide more of that evidence up front just to meet that threshold requirement. Um, then when we get to the, um, you know, the actual national interest waiver criteria, um, you know, this is a very um, generally very paper heavy application. So lots of information um, that you're going to be putting in here for these various different, um, you know, uh, different requirements. So, you know, we th we're thinking about for proof of substantial merit and national importance, you want news articles, academic papers, market research. Um, you know, if you're able to demonstrate 
that um, there is, you know, significant government reports outlining, you know, th this issue and why this is an important thing. Um, you know, anything within your particular industry, uh, you know, if you are an entrepreneur, you want to include a business plan, you know, that outlines kind of what issue your uh, your proposed endeavor is addressing, you know, how your company will make money, why it will be sustainable, um, any other objective evidence to demonstrate substantial merit and national importance. So you really want to think about, um, you know, there should be kind of objective, independently verifiable, um, you know, reports that are identifying this issue that that you're saying has substantial merit and national importance. Um, another thing you'll include will be expert letters. The letters will kind of have two different, um, you know, you, you can have letters that really address two of the different prongs. So you can have letters that just focus on substantial merit and national importance. You can have letters that just focused on how you, the applicant, are well positioned to advance the proposed endeavor. However, most letters will probably address both. Um, it can be quite good to have kind of experts in the industry who are very aware of why this endeavor has substantial merit and national importance, who can also speak to, um, you know, even if they don't know you personally, that can actually be better, but they can speak to, well, this is the work this person is doing. This is the history this person has, and this is why, you know, we believe, you know, this person is well positioned to advance this endeavor. So you want those expert letters to, um, you know, really kind of um, verify a lot of the other information you're including um, and, um, and speak to your accomplishments in the industry. Um, in terms of proving that you are well positioned to advance the endeavor, besides the expert letters, you'll need to have, you know, your resume, your degree, any proof of professional accomplishments, so any awards you've won, any patents, um, if you present at conferences regularly, if you have any industry or media attention that's happened, if you've published, any of those things are very helpful. Um, perhaps if you're an entrepreneur, you've run similar companies in the past, or even if not similar companies, you've have a history of, you know, taking uh, companies that are in a particular space and, you know, getting them to a place of success. So anything that you have in your background that can show why you are well positioned to advance this endeavor is going to be helpful. Um, entrepreneurs can also include proof of contracts, letters of intent. Um, startup capital can be very, very helpful um, because you want to show that your plan is realistic. Um, as, as I mentioned, you can also have an economist report, which will talk about job creation, um, you know, and, and and what economic benefit your company will have, you know, for, um, you know, for the United States. Great. And Kelly, a question came in that's relevant. Um which is, as part of the NIW application, does the applicant need to show a proposed plan uh, of what they'll be doing in the U.S. once the NIW is granted? So, yes, um, there does have to be a statement of proposed endeavor, um, and there does need to be a discussion of what you'll be doing in the United States. Um, that will kind of be a through line that goes through the whole application. Um, you know, besides your statement of proposed endeavor, if you're an entrepreneur, there could be a business plan. Um, generally, the expert letters will also touch upon this. So, yes, like th that, that is something that has to be uh, part of the application. Perfect. With that, we can move on to our case study. Perfect. All right, so let's talk a little bit about um, an NIW case that was successful for an entrepreneur. Um, in this case, um, this applicant formed a small consulting firm to work on projects focused on improving services to U.S. veterans. Um, so looking at just each of the uh, national interest waiver criteria um, for substantial merit and national importance, there were expert letters, there was news and media articles, there was research reports, um, you know, all of these kind of outlined very specific problem, a very specific, you know, set of difficulties facing returning veterans, and also discuss the value and importance of providing, you know, important services to these veterans. So there was also all of these um, reports, you know, were also supported by letters from experts and leaders in military, government, business, and charitable institutions. Um, as well, there was kind of outside independent media, um, evidence that the federal government itself had its own initiatives ongoing to address these issues. Um, and so it was just very clear from the balance of the evidence that there was substantial merit and national importance here. Um, in terms of the, the actual applicant proving that he was well positioned to advance the proposed endeavor, um, you know, he provided, you know, letters from government officials, business and philanthropic leaders and industry experts that had worked with him on these issues and were able to, you know, attest to the type of success he had, um, his ability to particularly, you know, manage millions of dollars, put millions of dollars to productive use, um, you know, connect various organizations that would then provide services and have, you know, um, demonstrably successful 
successful outcomes. So, you know, talking about the impacts of these previous projects that he had run, I think was a very compelling way to, um, to get this case approved. Additionally, it, this was an entrepreneur case and, um, he submitted a business plan, which identified potential clients, um, described the startup funding that they had, described sales and staffing projections, um, you know, as well had letters from, uh, you know, outside parties that planned to um, refer clients to this organization. So that showed that it wasn't just a business plan, but there actually were, uh, you know, already clients interested in working with this company, um, had financial statements that showed the viability of the plan. And then um, on, on balance, it was beneficial to the U.S. to waive this requirement as this person was an entrepreneur, as a self-employed entrepreneur, it was not, it would not have been possible um, for them to obtain a labor certification. Additionally, the value of the services that he planned to provide and his track record of success showed that even if there were other U.S. workers um, who were qualified to perform these services, the U.S. is still benefiting from the, you know, the value and the weight of these contributions. Um, so, you know, kind of utilizing each of these steps, this was how this applicant was ultimately successful with the national interest waiver. Perfect. Kelly, you've shared a large amount of great information with us and uh, our, we have a, a very active audience asking great questions. So I've saved a number of those for now for this part of the presentation. Um, let's start, we have a couple of questions asking about our fees and I'll just, I'll just quickly respond to that by saying, if you have any questions about your specific circumstances, please don't hesitate to reach out to our firm directly um, uh, on our website. We have our phone number, we have our email address, and we have a link where you can schedule a consultation. Um, and that way it's easier for us to discuss the specifics of your circumstances, which are important to discuss in these applications. Um, our process is once you've reached out to us, we do share an engagement letter that details the process and our fees. And of course, we are happy to talk, talk through any questions at that time. Um, now, Kelly, uh, related to the question of expert letters, how many letters from experts is typically enough to present with an NIW application? So I think there is no exact number. Um, I, I'd say that our, our petitions generally include anywhere from three at an absolute minimum, um, you know, maybe up to eight at a maximum. Um, I think that you know, expert letters are, can be very helpful, particularly if they're from, you know, very, very high up industry leaders, but they really need to be supported with objective evidence. So I think, um, you know, somewhere between three and eight, um, but kind of the exact number would really depend on the, the type of case you're presenting and the strength of evidence you have beyond the expert letters. Perfect. And going back to a topic we discussed earlier, which is the topic of dual intent and having a visa, a non-immigrant visa while you're uh, uh, pursuing a green card, someone has asked how long extensions for B1 and B2 visas are taking. I, I just took a look at the USCIS website. It is taking anywhere between 10 months and over two years. So these uh, extensions for B1 or B2 status are taking a while. Given that, Kelly, um, what, how does it work um, if someone needs to apply for an extension of B1 or B2 status after they file the I-140? I know you touched on this before. Uh, what should they keep in mind and what's the best way to navigate that? Sure. So I think that if you, you know, if you're, if you filed an I-140 petition and you're, you know, you're here on a B1, B2 visa, um, and I think your ability to extend is really going to depend on a few things. So one is, you know, why are you extending? Um, you know, your ability to extend as a B1 or B2 is really based on whether or not you are here doing, um, you know, something that's permitted either as a tourist or business visitor or one of the subcategories of B1 or B2. So, um, you know, like if you have an I-140 that's that you've filed and you've indicated on the I-140 that you intend to consular process, and let's say you're here and you want to extend because you really want to go to Disney World for another, you know, four weeks, and um, you have evidence of that, then sure, I think you can extend your B-1 or B-2, um, you know, um, asking for that time because you're trying to stay for a, a, a tourist um reason, you would have to disclose on the application um, if you've had an immigrant petition pending, um, you know, but it wouldn't necessarily prevent you from getting your extension granted. Um, however, if you're just trying to extend the B1, B2 to stay here while 
you know, to see if the I-140 becomes current, so then you can file an adjustment of status. I think that would be, you know, very risky, likely to be denied. Um, so it really would depend on, you know, what are your actual plans? What are your reasons for extending the B-1, B-2? Um, are they permissible reasons, uh, you know, kind of, and um, do you have that evidence that you still have ties to your home country? Um, and do they believe you really plan to consular process if that's what you checked on your I-140? Perfect. An interesting question, how long do you need to work in the domain that is the scope of the NIW application after the visa is approved? So, I mean, when you're getting your national interest waiver, you are, um, you know, or you're stating in good faith to the government that this is what you plan to do in the United States. So if in the future that, you know, you get your green card and then in the future, your plans change, um, you know, I think that that's okay, you know, as long as um, there is some explanation for what happened, you know, why is it you're no longer working in that field? Um, and I, I think it, you know, should be a good faith explanation. Um, so usually, like often where this would come up is, let's say that you get your green card, um, you stop working in your field, and then you go to get your, um, your US citizenship years later, they will often look at the underlying circumstances under which you got your green card. And, you know, part of the, you um, uh, citizenship application is showing what your work history is. And if in your work history, you're either not working, or you're not working in the same space, it's something that could come up. And if they have concerns that, um, you know, anything that was represented in the national interest waiver application was not, you know, was, was not actually stated in good faith, there's not really an explanation um, for why you're no longer working in that field. Um, you know, that's something that could come up at that stage and, it, you know, could potentially cause them to look back at the green card application and reopen it. So that's just to say that, there is no mandated period of time, um, but anything you're representing in the application about, you know, your intent to work in the field, you know, should be true at the time that you submit it. Absolutely. And I'm not sure I understand this question. It seems like it's on the same topic as, uh, you know, a time frame that applies, but how long can one take to get a job after the EB2 is granted? Do you do you understand what that's getting at or? So I, I, I'm not, um, I'm not exactly sure. What I'll say is um, the EB2 is something where you can either be sponsored by an employer or you can self-petition. If you are self-petitioning, then you never need to um, kind of, you know, get a, like, like, what you need to be doing is what you state you're doing in your application. So let's say you have your own company, you need to be working for that company. Let's say that you um, plan to be offering, you know, you're going to be a solo consultant, consulting for multiple organizations, you know, you would do that. So um, there's no kind of one, um, you know, there's no kind of kind of one time period in which you need to get a job either you will, um, you know, you have to produce evidence that you kind of are going to be working in this area and it has to be, you know, enough evidence that they're convinced that it will actually, um, you know, go through. So there's not kind of a period of time in which you have to get a job, but um, in terms of, you know, actually the evidence of advancing your endeavor, you know, that's something that, um, you know, you should have, um, you know, kind of should have available even while the application is ongoing. Perfect. As someone has asked, can we get the recording of this session? Yes, you can. We will send an email after this uh, presentation with a link to where you can find the recording. Um, so Kelly, is there a limit to how many times you can apply for an NIW? For example, if you have two potentially qualifying areas. There's, there's not, um, you know, that like if, if you have, um, you know, you certainly can apply. Um, I think that it, I think it would make sense to not apply with, you know, at, two different endeavors at the same time, I think it would make sense to try to tackle one at a time. But let's say you go with one endeavor and it, it you know, ultimately isn't approved, you could apply using a different endeavor. Great. And you mentioned, you've mentioned a couple of times that the NIW can be for entrepreneurs or it can be actually sponsored by an employer. Do you have a sense of um, the success rate or how difficult it is in, in each of those categories? So I think that, um, you know, the success rate, I think, you know, it's just too broad, uh, you know, like ultimately, I think either one is very viable, is a very viable approach. I think the benefit um, of doing a self-petition, obviously, is that if something happens with your employer, if there's a work situation that changes, you're not tied into that employer, whereas 
if your employer filed the I-140 for you, um, and now you're working in the same field, but with a different employer, then you would have to file a different application. So I think that very often for um, maximum flexibility, it can be very helpful to file as a self-petition um, as opposed to filing through an employer. Great. Uh, a question came in after the NIW is approved. Does the government keep <laughs> record of your application and for how long? Um, we can't know for sure how long the government will keep your application, but as Kelly said before, if you're applying for citizenship or really any benefit down the road, it's always best to assume that the government has your prior applications in front of it. So, so make that assumption, even though we don't know for sure whether they're going to keep it in the archives or not and if they're going to refer to it. Um, Kelly, this question, you know, may, may be better answered through a consultation, but is, is there anything to be aware of for someone who has TPS and has a pending asylum application, might NIW still be an option on the table for them to apply for, or are there any prohibitions they should be aware of? Yeah, that, I'd say that would definitely be an, a, a question for a consultation, because um, I think there's just a lot of moving pieces there, um, and just many, you know, just going to be very, very specific based on that person's, you know, like p potential, potentially they could, mm -hmm. um, you know, but I think something that you really want to speak with an attorney just to understand the full circumstances. Great. And there's another question that I think gets at, gets at something that that is a common question we get. Um so this question is, can an NIW be pursued without having a business already established in the U.S.? So this is someone with an employee with 10 plus years of experience. And one of the things um, you, you've already answered that the NIW can be for either an entrepreneur or uh, a sponsored role. But the other thing that this question gets at that I think is helpful to kind of flesh out a little bit is if someone is applying with a, an idea for a business, and is applying with a business plan. Um, how fleshed out does that idea need to be? What should the business plan represent? Sure. So I, I think that if you're applying with kind of a very a pure startup that has not started operations at all, you do want to have quite a um, quite a detailed business plan. Uh, you know, so the business plan should really outline, you know, exactly what you plan to do, should demonstrate, you know, how you plan to fund the operation, how many people you plan to hire. You know, you want the officer to really get a good sense that um, even though this has not started operation yet, that it, um, you know, has the has legs, has the ability to really, um, you know, start operating very shortly. Additionally, in that type of circumstance, I think it's very important that the person have some type of track record of success um, building a similar type of of operation. I think that if you're in a situation where you your business is you know just purely on paper, nothing has really happened yet. Um, as, if you can demonstrate that in the past you have done something similar and created a successful outcome, that's going to be really key to um, you know the success of that application. Great. Um, what is, there's a question here about a father's business. I think really the underlying question here is what is the ownership requirement it, for an entrepreneur applying for an NIW? How much of the business do they need to own and how do they show ownership? Sure. So there is no ownership requirement for the national interest waiver. Um, you know, the national interest waiver, you can self-petition and, and you don't have to be an entrepreneur to self-petition. Um, you know, like the key is just what is your proposed endeavor? So if you own 5% of a business and your proposed endeavor is you are going to be, you know, the chief operating officer of this business that you own 5% of, and here's what you're going to do with the business. Um, and you're also going to consult, you know, and, and and work in other areas in that industry. You know, you know, the benefit of the NIW is there is, you know, that ability to kind of expansively define um, your endeavor. What is it you plan to do? Um, and um, so there is no requirement that you own, uh, you know, a significant amount of the company, uh, you know, or any of it. Um, you know, but however, if you are an entrepreneur, and that's the basis of your argument. Generally, you want to own enough that you have a say over the company um, or that the people who do have the majority say over the company are supportive of the application. Great. Once you are granted an NIW and you're in the U.S., obviously you have authorization to work for that enterprise. But if you wanted to do something, say, uh, to teach business to students or to uh, this question says work in an incubation as a manager. I'm assuming that is work outside of the endeavor. 
Uh, is that permitted? And and what kind of work can you do outside of what the NIW explicit, the NIW enterprise, if you're applying as an entrepreneur? Sure. So, I mean, ultimately, once your green card is granted, the green card permits you to work anywhere. Um, you know, so I, I'd say at that point, like, you know, you know, a few things. So one is you potentially can, you know, fold in some of these other, you know, uh, activities into your endeavor. You know, I, I had a, a, a client who, um, you know, they, they self-petitioned and they wanted to work for multiple universities. They wanted to work for, you know, multiple government agencies, multiple private actors, and that's what they did. Um, you know, so, so you can kind of fold in multiple different things if they, you know, there's all a through line to kind of your proposed endeavor and you can show it has substantial merit and national importance. That being said, even if this is not kind of primarily what you're going to be doing, it's a bit outside the scope. Once you have your green card, as long as your primary activity is still kind of the national interest waiver work, um, you know, doing these other ancillary, you know, types of, of services or, um, you know, activities is fine. Um, you know, your green card would permit you to, uh, to do those things. Great. Um, there are a couple more questions about dual intent. Um, if your E2 needs renewal in November of this year, can you submit an NIW now? And also a question, can a person on a valid B1, B2 search for jobs, attend interviews? How should one proceed for filing an NIW while on a valid B1, B2? Um, Kelly, I know you've you've touched on, on this topic broader and your answer from before would apply to these in, in summary that if you are on a non-immigrant visa and you need to renew it on the horizon, it's probably best to do that before you submit an I-140, which does suggest to the government that you have the intention of applying for a green card and might raise issues. Um, the government, USCIS, actually recently issued um, a, a policy memo saying that you actually can search for jobs and attend interviews on a B-1 visa while in B-1 status. Um, that is relatively new guidance, though. Um, and Kelly, any thoughts on filing an NIW while you're on a, a valid B1, B2? I know you've you've touched on that already. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's possible to do, um, but I think that you know you have to be prepared. Um, you know, right now you couldn't concurrently file, so you know, kind of filing the I140 doesn't give you any status in the United States. And then once that's filed, you know, and you have to leave the United States, you know, kind of and re-enter re-entering might be more tricky on a B1 and B2. And um, if you do go this route and you do want to continue to kind of enter the United States periodically, you definitely want to check um, consular processing on your I-140 as opposed to adjustment of status to be able to provide that argument, you know, that you um, intend to, you know, adjust or uh, get your green card outside the United States. Yeah. Great. Does the NIW enterprise need to be for profit or can it be a humanitarian project, which I assume to mean a nonprofit? It can be a humanitarian project. It does not have to be for profit. Um, it, you know, and, you know, many, many kind of humanitarian projects could be said to have substantial merit and national importance. And as long as you can meet the three, you know, criteria that we've discussed, you know, you, um, you know, you can still qualify even if it's with a nonprofit. Great. This question um, that came up, I, I know is a common one, especially since our firm handles E2 visas very frequently, which tend to be for businesses such as franchises, restaurants, smaller businesses. If someone has, say, a restaurant franchise, um, they're on an E2, can they apply for the NIW with a business of that size, uh, which has seven to 10 employees, maybe a million dollars in revenue? Would that satisfy the national scope that's required of the NIW? So generally, no. Um, I, I think that this is a very common um, kind of question we get from many of our clients. Um, what I'd say is that for something to have substantial merit and national importance, there needs to be more of a hook than just um, you have a business that it employs a certain number of employees. I think that um, when we're if the business was to focus only on job creation as the only area of substantial merit and national importance, the hiring would have to be much larger than seven to ten. Um, and would have to, you know, be in a demonstrably, um, you know, economically depressed area where there'd be a really strong argument that that level of hiring, you know, kind of was, you know, of substantial merit and national importance. So, you know, the, when you're thinking about what is the proposed endeavor, you know, you have to come back to that. Does it have substantial merit? Does it have national importance? And a business just operating regularly on its own is generally not going to rise to that level. You also need to have these other elements 
um, to demonstrate, you know, how are you, how are you kind of changing something in the industry for the better? How are you um, advancing some technology? How are you helping the U.S. become more competitive, um, you know, in some way with the type of work that you're doing? So there does need to be that other element um, besides just running the business and paying employees and paying, um, you know, vendors in the United States. Great. And we, we do we do have uh, about five minutes left. So the questions that are coming in are great. Um, we will have to have to end them at 11, unfortunately, uh, Eastern time. Uh, but but please do uh, continue sending them in in the meantime. Um, Kelly, what are the benefits to family members? Um, can child, do children get any benefits through an NIW, for example, spouses? Yes. So um, your spouse and any child, unmarried children under 21 are eligible to adjust status with you or to get the green card with you, um, you know, when you um, when you go to get your green card. Mm -hmm. Great. And uh, there was a question here about, uh, I believe it's asking the government's fees. I'm, I'm pulling those up just to make sure I'm, I'm ha I have the most current fees. Do you happen to know about what it costs on the government's end to file and uh, in, in, in IW? Uh, well, I mean, so for my 140, um, I think the, the filing fee is a $700. Oh, right. And then um, if you're also filing for the an adjustment of status, uh, the it's $1,225 per applicant for most applicants. Um, and then the work and travel authorizations are free if you file those at the same time. You know, that's as of right now, you know, that they're always kind of making an argument for higher fees. And then if you want to do the premium processing, it's $2,500. Perfect. Um, okay, let's see. Um, I know there's a question here that seems to be very specific to one's experience, asking if experience counts as 10 years or seven. I would say that's the kind of question that we can discuss through a consultation, since we, we would want to know more about exactly um, what, what your experience and background entails. So please do feel free to reach out to us. And can any employer file in an in, in NIW? Let's say this is not an entrepreneur. Uh, does the the employee need any certain amount of time that they need to have worked for the employer before the employer petitions for them? They don't know, um, you know, so any kind of, um, you know, any, any U.S. employer can file, uh, you know, can file for the, the NIW for uh, an applicant. Great. And we do only have three more questions. Um, so I know there's a question about B1, B2. You can file for consular processing. I think that was that was Kelly's recommendation in order to avoid dual intent issues. You can apply for an NIW through consular processing if you're in the U.S. on a uh, non-immigrant visa. Um, so Kelly, I don't know if you had a chance to look at any of the remaining three. My sense is that these would be better discussed through a consultation since they're very specific to the degrees. Um, that someone has, such as does an M is an MBA sufficient as proof of higher education for an NIW? Um, yeah, I mean, so yeah, I think some of these very specific ones, you know, we can answer the general. So generally, yes, a master's of business administration, if earned from a U.S., um, you know, uh, a U.S. university is going to count, um, you know, for the, the th threshold requirement. Um, sometimes there are some foreign de master's degrees that don't work out equivalency wise, you know, to, to be an advanced degree. So always something to discuss if it's not a U.S. degree. Um, on the question, the, this question about, you know, the NIW petition having to align with your education field. Um, so, I mean, generally, if you're trying to, yes, like there, there needs to be a nexus. Like if you're trying to say, I qualify for the EB2 because I have a master's degree in fine art and I want to do a, um, uh, you know, proposed endeavor in business, like that's not going to work. There needs to be a nexus between, uh, you know, what your degree is in and what your proposed endeavor is. Um, you know, so you could try to, um, you know, kind of the specifics of trying to make that argument, um, you know, I think are, are certainly something that can be discussed if there is some type of tie-in between the, the master's degree or bachelor's and work experience and the, um, you know, and the proposed endeavor. Um, this question about, you know, do they, uh, you know, when you naturalize, do they audit you? Um, so when you naturalize, they will look at your work history and they they can always dig into the, um, you know, what you've done. Will they do an extensive audit of exactly what you did each year? Not necessarily, but could they, if they suspect there was some type of fraud or misrepresentation, they absolutely could. So, um, you know, like always 
you know, you always want to keep that in mind um, that it's, it's not, you know, this is not a matter of just filing paperwork. It's a matter of filing paperwork that reflects what you actually plan to do. Right. And I know there's a question about the visa bulletin. Uh, I just took a look. No countries are current in the EB2 category, but the bulletin changes every month. And if you see that your country is current, that does mean that you can file the I-485 at the same time as the I-140 for that country. Um, Kelly, I'm not sure if you have thoughts on the 10 plus years of experience. Yeah. So I, what, I, what I'd say is that, um, you know, uh, just experience alone, like just saying I have experience in a field, like we would need much more information than that to understand, you know, whether or not it would qualify you for, for a national interest waiver. There'd be many pieces to that. So um, I'm not, you know, I, I don't think I can really answer this question because, um, you know, have we had cases where employees have been granted national interest waivers with all different levels of experience? Yes. Uh, but it's all just very specific on their particular fact. So I would encourage you to set up a, a consultation to discuss that particular question in your background. Perfect. And with that, it is 11 o'clock our time. Um, this has been one of the most active presentations, webinars I've been a part of. So thank you all in the audience for sh sending in such great questions. Kelly, thank you for sharing your expertise. We will be following up with a link to uh, the recording of this webinar. And do in the meantime, check out our YouTube channel where we have the, uh, other webinars and short videos that we hope uh, you'll find helpful. And never hesitate to reach out to us through a consultation by phone or by email. Thank you all, Kelly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a nice day.